Welcome to Spring Corvicon, where the oil and gas community comes together to collaborate and shape the future. We're so excited to have you here at Corva HQ, and thanks to the hundreds of people who have joined our live stream remotely. Corvicon is centered around community, connection, and collaboration. Let's dive into what that means for you. First and foremost, Corvicon is about the oil and gas community coming together to share ideas. Leading operators, partners, and Corva team leads are here today to share valuable pers perspectives, exciting trends, and best practices. Get a bird's eye view into the fast changing landscape of digital oil field transformation from the front lines. You'll learn what the digital tools are being deployed to co contain capital spending and power up performance. The definition of what it means to outperform is evolving. Faster, better, safer, and more profitable? Sure, we can do that. But today, the industry and market participants have finally realized just how connected we all are. Connected to the environment and connected through common purpose to elevate social responsibility and governance. ESG is, just, is now an important KPI, like footage in the zone and stages per day. We'll be on the front line of change with our ESG panel discussion later today. We'll follow that up with breakout sessions for drilling, completions, and developers. So stick it around. We have an amazing day planned for you. The future of innovation and the way we do business in the energy industry going forward is all about collaboration, working together to create synergy and new opportunities. The world has changed. The internet changed everything. And in oil and gas, we are just seeing the effects. We live in a world with open source, blockchain, and Wikipedia. Energy professionals must manage the complexities of physical oil-filled assets alongside digital oil-filled assets, big data sets, and rapidly growing ecosystem of software. The future is going to be led by the people who work together to solve these massive challenges. Forging strong partnerships is part of that collaborative mindset to gather partners working together to build an innovative future. Data silos and the days of vendors building solutions that can't plug and play will be ancient history. We see the workplace of the future fully integrated, every application integrating with the entire software ecosystem. Let's take a look at some of these integrations. Power BI and Spotify are now commonplace for custom data exploration and prototyping. There's a whole ecosystem popping up to allow for exporting data from APIs like Corva into these BI tools. We see these BI tools providing the basic level of data analysis needed for quick visualization. And we expect all software in the future will seamlessly integrate. Enterprise communication used to happen everywhere, but now it's being pushed to chat apps like Microsoft Teams and Slack. Instead of hundreds of emails, you can organize communication around standard topics and track all updates there. Corva expects integration around these chat apps to proliferate, like workflow tools and analysis reports. We have already been integrating completions real-time end of stage report with Microsoft Teams, and customers love it. There's a big opportunity to finally start connecting oil and gas software packages and databases where drilling, completion, and production live. To share more about our powerful new Wellview integration, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Kuhn from Peloton. Michael, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Uh, it's nice to be here today. Um, it's great to be in person with some people and certainly with some people dialing in after a bit of a crazy year last year. Uh, I think I saw in the news last night, UFOs are, are coming back, so anything's possible in 2021. Uh, certainly with the theme here, they may be in attendance, we never know. So this is great. Uh, it's uh, like uh, Ryan mentioned, my name is Mike Kuhn. I manage US operation for Peloton. Um, I'm glad to be here today to just introduce a bit of the collaboration uh, between our two companies and just talk about that. Uh, there'll be a session later uh, to get in more details. Uh, just to, everyone loves a little origin story. I want to tell a little bit about Peloton. Some of you may be customers, some of you may not know Peloton. Uh, for Peloton, it began with two brothers. There was a software developer and a petroleum engineer. Petroleum engineer drew a little sketch, 
handed it over to the software developer and said, can you draw this from the data? And for Peloton, that was our original problem statement. And from that time, that evolved into obviously WellView, which is the software we're talking about today. Over time, we've evolved and expanded from that. We actually started in completions. Many people think we started in drilling. Uh, but over time, working with our customers, we've expanded uh, beyond that. Today, uh, we're celebrating our 30th year in business, uh, supporting over 600 customers around the world. Uh, when you are supporting global software solution, that does get to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, apparently, a few people use, uh, don't use standard units outside the US. That's a, that's a new one, so the metric system's out there. There's language support, infrastructure, all of those challenges exist, but also at the same time, you need to make it very easy for that end user experience. Uh, so as we came through uh, and worked with customers over the years, we've expanded outside of drilling completions, moving into production land, uh, and, but still keeping those principles of data management and supporting the quality of data for people. And that's really where a lot of the collaboration comes together uh, between our two companies. Uh, we are in Calgary, that's where our head office is. Houston and Denver is where US is supported for many of you would be, uh, would be uh, collaborating with us. Um, just moving on a little bit now to talk about the collaboration. Uh, got to meet Ryan and the team, I think in about 2018 maybe, late 2018, first got to meet them and uh, we've been talking over the years. It's very difficult a lot of times when two independent software companies to come together. So a couple things have really uh, been the ingredients to make this come together. One, you've got companies that are very interested in solving problems for customers. Uh, the alignment is there in terms of what we're doing and our goals. But then the secret ingredient really is there's customers to pull us along. So what's been great about this collaboration to date is that we've had some customers who informed us and talked to us about how they want to see the data move back and forth uh, between the two organizations. Um, and this afternoon at 2.30, there's a breakout. I'm here to invite you to go attend that to find out any detailed questions. Don't ask me, I don't handle the hard questions, so uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or try to, but Rob Herman, our US Solutions Manager, is gonna go through the integration to talk about that in detail, talk about where that can go. Uh, today, there is integration in place. It is working with customers. Uh, Ryan and our product development team are working on some additional capabilities to bring forward. Uh, but like we've always done and, and like Corva does, we wanna hear from you. And we wanna continue to grow that collaboration. So please do attend. Uh, please also uh, uh, give us your feedback and let us know how it's going, okay? That's all I had for today. I'll look forward to it. I'm gonna hand it back over to Ryan, okay? Thank you very much. Oil and gas has historically been slow moving. But to survive in the future, oil and gas needs to be nimble and agile, marked by quick change and data-driven decisions. We need to make real-time decisions that account for a multitude of scenarios and possibilities, all the while maximizing resources. The factors that go into today's software applications change rapidly, so rapidly that the software can't keep up. In the world of frac, you can see this happening. Fracture diagnostics, chemicals, and diverters change practically every month. The flavor of the month is what works down the lease road. How do you build software that adapts to real world challenges when the reality, this is the reality of change? What the industry needs is a first class development platform built on a foundation that allows you to go from concept to worldwide deployment in weeks, not years. Six months ago, we started on a journey to empower the rest of the industry with a platform that promised just that, build as quickly as the world changed. That's not a small undertaking. We are essentially introducing a technology that is not just cutting edge for oil and gas, but a big paradigm change for any industry. With this thinking, we reasoned that the industry could lead the world as a case study in innovation. Typically, a software developer in oil and gas spent 95% of their time on the infrastructure and only 5% on the actual solution. We're flipping the model. You spend 95% on the actual problem and we'll handle the infrastructure. This is going to power a whole new evolution of tools. You'll have a companion app to your drill bit, mud motor, and any other tools that you were buying. Why not? 
We're going to empower operators, rig and frack contractors, service companies, and startups to build the future. The future starts now. Dev Center is about finally enabling everyone to build what they want fast. I'm going to let Greg update you on what's new with Dev Center. Last October, we released our MVP of the Dev Center. Since then, we've made numerous amounts of updates to provide more value and features to our Dev Center customers. Our customers are able to deploy more apps, they're able to access more data, and they're able to create better visualizations within there. From my previous experience as a, as a completion engineer within an operator, um, there was always a challenge with uh, creating uh, real-time dashboards, and really they didn't really exist. So we had Excel sheets, we had Spotfire, we had uh, Power BI. But now customers are able to develop their own apps. So if an engineer really wants to see a visualization that's custom to them, they can just come to Dev Center and create it. The future of Dev Center is an ecosystem of applications that are deployed by ENPs and service companies alike into the corporate environment for use by their teams. The mantra of Dev Center is build apps faster. The original Corvo, we could build apps pretty quickly internally, but the entire Dev Center product is really around the focus of enabling, you know, number one, our customers to build apps themselves, number two, partners to build apps themselves in Corva and display in the Corva environment, but also for us internally, build apps faster. Thanks, Ryan. Um, since the fall release, we've been working hard to enable Dev Center early adopters to build and deploy their first apps. Uh, at the same time, Corva has continued our work to make Dev Center the platform of choice for oil and gas apps. Last year, ExxonMobil deployed an app in Dev Center to help them avoid drilling hazards. And last month, our partner Drill Defrac began selling their completions hazard analysis app via Dev Center to our mutual customers. This powerful new app uses data acquired while drilling to identify potential frack hazards. This ensures a safe and effective fracking operation. We'll have a chance to go into more detail on the Drill to Frack app in a few minutes, um, but first I'd like to highlight a few major advancements to Dev Center and the Corva App Store since their launch last October. At Corva, we never stop innovating. Every two weeks, we release a round of Dev Center enhancements, and we have a simple goal build apps faster. Uh, we are constantly working on ways to enable ourselves, our customers, and our partners to deliver apps at breakneck speed. You'll see this as the common theme of all of our recent Dev Center enhancements. We completed the work to enable users to create data, sec data sets and indexes with just a few clicks. Data sets are the backbone of the Corva ecosystem. Apps read to and write from data sets constantly, providing life to visuals and algorithms. Creating these data sets has never been easier. We overhauled our documentation pages, providing your developers access to the most up-to-date information available as we expand and update the platform. <clears throat> We've published our Node and Python software development kits on GitHub. These SDKs make connecting backend apps and algorithms to the Corva API simple and easy. The SDK also provides interface to turn on and off logging in your backend app. Once an app is deployed, the debugging log is now passed on to developers. Our log events table is simple and easy to use, taking the guesswork out of finding data that you need to fix, monitor, and optimize your apps. Corva users are familiar with asset selectors, which are used to select wells, rigs, and frack fleets. These asset selectors are now available out of the box in Dev Center, allowing your operations team to use your home-built applications just as easily as Corva's. At Corva, our interface design team uses reusable React components to get a leg up and build apps faster. Inside Dev Center, we've shared those components with you. Why build a new button or dropdown when you can copy and paste ours? Our component library is continuously growing and evolving to give devs access to commonly used components, making their lives easy and their apps better. We've made it really simple and easy to manage and test multiple versions of an app. From, an app, from the app versions page, devs can upload multiple versions 
to test on live drilling and completions data and give their operations team access to beta versions. When you're ready to deploy your tested app to the world, there is zero code to publish. Simply mark your newest version as stable and it's instantly accessible to your team. Building real-time applications can be daunting to the first-time user. To make it easier, our team developed basic sample applications as starting points for first-time developers. As well, they serve as great boilerplate code to start building a custom developed app. We built front-end, back-end, Python, and Node samples to encompass all, all app types available to DevCenter. Lastly, I'd like to show you how we've moved the ball down the field for our app store. Starting with the completely revamped and stunning new, new UI, App Store now has the look and feel of Netflix. Apps are now much easier to find, and with more information about each app, including video and Wikipedia-style content, users can know exactly what the app can do for them before they hit Add to Dashboard. Those are the, the major new milestones for DevCenter and the App Store. Now I'd like to hand it over to Meg from drill to frac to share how they use DevCenter to build an app to identify completion hazards. Hi, this is quite the crowd. I'm very excited to be here today, see some familiar faces, have the opportunity to speak in person. I wanna start by giving a quick thanks to Ryan, Courtney, and the entire Corva management team um, for this opportunity. I am Meg Dodge, I'm the general manager at Drill the Frack. I know I speak for our entire team when I say how excited we are about the new release of our first of hopefully many Corva applications, it's the Drill to Frack Completion Hazards Assessment. When we had the opportunity to incorporate our industry-leading data analysis with Corva's industry-leading real-time platform, it really, the synergies were quite obvious to us. Before I go too much further, one more kudos out to the Corva Dev Center team. You guys were, we were thoroughly impressed and thankful for your diligent efforts to get this done so quickly. So thank you guys very much. As a company, it's our mission to create actionable data using data clients already have. In doing this, we generate a rock hardness profile that we refer to as our Omnilog. Over the last seven plus years and now approaching a thousand wells, it has been a mission of ours to continue to stay relevant to the industry, industry through developing multiple applications of this log. Today, the name of the game is efficiency. Do more with less. Cost efficiency, time efficiency, completion efficiencies, operational execution efficiencies. Leveraging data you already have means no tool downhole, no operational downtime, quick turnaround time. These things together equal low cost and low impact to your well's AFE. Incorporating a platform to use that data real time ensures you get the most out of it and really brings the value of your data full circle. The value of our Omnilog does span multiple operator objectives, understanding wellbore and stage level heterogeneity, adapting completion design to wellbore properties, modeling fluid distribution, and identifying existing depletion in infill wells. For our first drill to frack app, we chose to focus on the completion hazards providing a stage-by-stage -stage analysis of variables that can often lead to completion inefficiencies. Completion engineers use this data to proactively identify stages that are most likely to be affected by geological hazards, such as the existence of depletion from an offset producing well, and stages with anomalous rock properties. This helps them take action to better predict and plan for potential operational challenges, which I'm sure a few of you have encountered, such as screen outs and direct frack hits. They're able to do this prior to those taking place. By teaming up with Corva, we can now bring our completion hazards map to the field, adding yet another value to the phrase actionable data. The synergy with Corva really enhances two key advantages. One is the ability to be proactive. Drill the frack can turn around the analysis within three to five business days post drilling TD. This allows the clients to understand their reservoir quality and associated identified completion hazards prior to finishing their completion design as well as executing their completions. 
This gives them the time to confidently implement a mitigation strategy that best fits their existing program. The next key variable is real-time management of the data when it's needed most, during completions. The drill to frack completion hazards are displayed in the Corva completion platform alongside your real-time completion data. This allows users to instantly see whether the rock properties, the existence of depleted fractures, or their completion design are influencing completion responses. If so, they can highlight future stages with similar properties and likely similar properties that are likely to encounter similar issues and plan ahead or choose to make any adjustments. Now what? We are often asked, we have the analysis, what do we do with it? In short, you use that analysis to fine tune your existing completion design in a way that will decrease risk associated with flagged hazards. You have existing depletion, avoid placing a cluster at the same depth as that depletion or too close to it. Adjust your stage boundaries so you completely avoid a significantly depleted fracture. You have high heterogeneity in a stage. Adjust cluster placement to optimize fluid distribution in each stage. Adjust stage boundary, again, to avoid a significant change in rock hardness. With the ability to visualize your data in our app on the Corva platform, you can also adjust a job real time based on treatment response and rock properties. For example, you have a stage where the pressure starts to increase soon after prop it, hence the formation. In real time, the operator can glance at the hazard assessment log and see this stage maybe has abnormally high rock MSC. Then presume they're not getting enough fracture width to place the prop in, so they then decide to increase fluid viscosity to ensure prop in is placed. With the unity between Drill to Frac's analysis app and Corva's real-time platform and dev center, our operators get max value out of their data and usage and can confidently make decisions to increase completion efficiency proactively or reactively when necessary. Our relationship with Corva and the clear synergy in this platform is just another step in the direction of adding value that truly makes a difference to our clients and our industry. And I know that that is a synergy that Drill to Frack and Corva have always had together. We'd love for you all to join us in the breakout session with Jason Glasscock, our lead reservoir advisor at Drill to Frack. He'll go over some high level review of Drill to Frack, our analysis, our process, He'll discuss some of the hazards associated with our analysis, and of course, provide a demo of the app, which is now live in the App Store. We look forward to working more with Corva, and especially all of you, to improve completion efficiencies through risk reduction and completion design optimization. Thank you for the opportunity today, and we look forward to speaking with you all soon. You know just how important data is in the digital oil field. Your team needs analysis-ready data at every moment. The problem is your team spends vast amounts of time and energy data wrangling, trading high-value workflows for low-value data curation. Data delays, information sprawl, multiple versions of the truth, exponentially growing volumes of raw well site data, and unstructured well files. It all stands in the way of what your team was actually hired to do. Energy professionals have been struggling with the data management dilemma for decades. Today, the top problems are data quality and data overload. You need a strategy to cleanse real-time data streams and accelerate time to analysis. Right here in this building is the heart of Corva's Real-Time Operations Center. We're going to share with you the best practices Corva has developed so that your team can continuously deliver high quality data needed for success. Cody is here to give you an inside look at the state of our, the art facility and share those best practices. In the oil field, they know people, they know hard work, and they know quality. When it comes to making the decisions that matter, only the best will do. With over 200 years of combined industry experience, our team is here to support your team 24-7, 365, call or text.
We work around the clock to make sure you have the support you need to run your operation smoothly. We do 140 checkpoint inspections on every well. We process over five terabytes of data per day. We help over a thousand customers a day. With an average response time of under 20 seconds, we do all of this so you can be your best and drive quality to new levels. I'm Alex Stanford and I'm a completions data analyst. I'm Cody Bird, Director of Operations. I'm Matthew Saunders. I'm the Drilling Technical Specialist. I'm Ahmed Zaid. I'm the Quality Control Analyst here. I'm John Carmona and I'm the Completions Junior Data Analyst. I'm Andre Benoit and I'm an Operations Coordinator. I'm Chase Valadez and I am an Operations and Stream Coordinator. I'm Regina Cho, Completions Operations Manager. Thanks, Ryan. I'm excited to take a deep dive into Corvus RTOC and data quality best practices. Quality, analysis-ready data at every moment to power operational decisions. That's the mission of Corvus Real-Time Operations Center. We process 10 terabytes of data every day for DNC operations around the world, continuously enhancing data quality and resolving client requests in less than 30 seconds on average. We handle the data quality and clients get to focus 100% on the business driver, whether that's optimizing drilling efficiency, rig flat time, footage in the zone, process safety, or horsepower hours for completions. And with more time for analysis, teams can monitor more assets simultaneously. So how do we do all this? Data quality success depends heavily on robust data infrastructure and continuous QC processes. But the real secret to data quality success is people. We built a very mature data quality organization, our A-team. There are six roles to consider. Operations analysts are charged with analyzing and quality controlling all data flowing into the RTOC. Junior analysts support operations analysts and are responsible for ensuring timely loading of static and unstructured data into the RTOC database. QC analysts are responsible for final data quality checks at the end of each well to ensure that the next well leverages a complete and quality controlled offset asset. Coordinators are our first line of defense for all new well data received. Data specialists provide special subject matter expertise in specific drilling and completions operations to ensure the highest levels of data quality. And our operations management provide continuous support to the entire team, ensuring that they have all the necessary tools and resources to succeed. These are the people behind Corba's real-time data quality. I would ask them to stand up, but most of them are downstairs in our data quality task force working right now to support client wells. Now let's take a look at some best practices for delivering data quality at every stage of well delivery. The data quality task force deploys robust processes for de validating drilling and completions data throughout the well life cycle. Pre-drill, Corva QCs for data completeness and setup of well assets. While drilling, Corva automatically runs WITSML data quality controls extracts and QC static data with people in the loop. In post-drill, Corva performs into well checks, scores well data, and preps data for offset well analysis. Our data quality task force uses a 140 point assessment to assign scores to each well. After the initial score is recorded, all corrections are made on the well and 100% quality well is then saved in Corva. That's how you drive data quality to new levels before, during, and after well delivery. Okay, that's my presentation. I hope that you've seen just how passionate Corva is about data quality. I'll hand things back over to Ryan. When it comes to analytics and step change in drilling optimization seen on land, offshore operators have been left behind. Why? Everything about offshore drilling is bigger and more expensive, including a daily burn rate of at least 10 times greater than on land. Deeper TVD, higher pressure, longer wells, complex BHAs, and more data to analyze. Offshore operators have long needed drilling optimization to match their unique complexities. But across the board, analytical tools haven't been up to the challenge. It can be argued that offshore has seen and been underserved, even neglected, by the lack of digital innovation. The waves of innovation that swept over the Permian and other onshore basins following the shale revolution never touched offshore platforms. But offshore drillers are just as hungry for the same advancements in ROP, wellbore placement, and productivity gains. They don't have the flexibility to simply lay down a rig when basins become uneconomic. 
and increasing break-even prices force teams to constantly look for ways to boost performance while squeezing costs. The future of offshore drilling optimization is an integrated platform of data, automation, and analytics. Chris is here to take a closer look at the integrated offshore rig of the future, some of the analytical best practices teams are deploying in waters worldwide. Offshore wells are crucial to the energy mix, but shifting economics and increasing break-even prices are forcing teams to continuously squeeze cost savings. Now is the time to innovate and shift the paradigm from using data for look-back analysis to real-time drilling optimization, subsurface to topside. Digital oil field innovation has left offshore drilling behind. You've got power slips and an automated drill floor, but digital systems like the innovation that powered the shale revolution. When it comes to offshore innovation, the status quo didn't want to rock the boat. Hydraulics modeling is an offline and time-consuming task. Your team spends hours searching MPT time codes for insights. And geoscience and engineering work in different tools to achieve the same goal. The offshore innovation lag gap has closed. The paradigm to shift into high gear with real-time offshore analytics. Instantly mine time codes to pinpoint ways to improve rig operations and crew performance. Compare wits and metal traces with the automatically predicted rig activity, comment, and collaborate around the data flow. Bring engineering and geoscience together inside a common log visualizer. Optimize every trip and every connection to shrink costs. Effortlessly model complex flow regimes and analyze flowback for leading indicators of kicks. That's the new digital offshore paradigm. The payoff is big. Data-driven drilling efficiency, less flat time, more productive wells add millions each year to the balance sheet. We are building the future of offshore drilling optimization together, and it's only the tip of the iceberg of what is possible. Thank you, Ryan. As much as 80% of offshore operation time is devoted to things that are not drilling. This includes BOP testing, changing complex BHAs, and many other non-productive time events. That's why analyzing flat time is so important, because even a small improvement can have significant benefits. And with the limited time per well when you are drilling, it's critical to optimize every foot drilled, every joint tripped, and each connection made. It's that important. Part of the problem is that when you're not drilling, you're not aut automatically capturing these, data, these analytics. Offshore operations typically spend a great deal of time on activities in between drilling and tripping. That means that there are large windows of flat time that weren't instantly available for analysis. We call this invisible flat time. You can't measure, or you can't manage what you don't measure, which is why we enabled a two-way conduit to your data source of truth. This completes the 24-hour picture of offshore operations by bringing live drilling KPIs together with invisible flat time events in a unified interface. This enables your team to benchmark rig operations while they're not drilling or tripping and identify op uh, areas of opportunity from rig repairs, cementing operations, BOP and formation testing, and much more. Now, let's look at some capabilities specifically tooled for offshore operations. First, let's start off with viewing time-based traces. Your team likely spends every minute of drilling and during critical operations staring at these screens. But there are so many data providers and interfaces, from the rig, mud loggers, MWD, cementers, et cetera, that the drilling team is overwhelmed with displays and distracted from their tasks. Now these disparate data sets that are housed are now housed within a unified interface alongside predicted and offset well data. This integrated real-time platform also means that drillers can add comments and annotations, which are then put into context with alerts, BHA details, mudway changes, and NPT events. Now your teams in the field and in the office view the same data the same way and can make more informed decisions quicker. 
Offshore teams also rely heavily on professionals from multiple disciplines that need to analyze broad data sets spanning drilling, geology, geophysics, petrophysics, and engineering. However, the asset team often works in separate software suites to accomplish their mission. This hinders co collaboration and slows the pace of decision making. Having this real-time unified view of the complete dr uh, drilling operation is especially valuable when it comes time for geoscience to declare mission accomplished and call well TD. Deepwater hydraulics are a complex and critical business with zero margin for error. BOPs are located thousands of feet below the rig floor on the seafloor. MPD systems commonly manage bottom hole pressure and dual gradient fluid columns make modeling increasingly difficult. How do you reliably manage these critical systems in real time? The future of offshore optimization includes automated and accurate hydraulics modeling. This empowers drillers to manage bottom hole pressure even when specialty tools are not physically measuring pressures. Think about how many operations involve dumb iron BHAs, test assemblies, and completion strings. Now your teams have a dynamic toolkit at their disposal to make better operational decisions without any additional work on their behalf. I also want you to think about how you could combine tripping KPIs with this hydraulics toolkit into a dynamic display to manage these risks during your tripping operations. Your team can trip as fast as they safely should and meet section goals without injecting additional risk of formation or tool damage. And speaking of tripping, much of the operating time of each well involves a great deal of tripping in and out of the hole. So a slight improvement for offshore connections and tripping can translate to significant savings per rig, per year, and even greater cost savings fleet-wide. These crew analytics enable you to track individual team performance, not just by day and night shift. You can now focus and evaluate KPIs statistically, focus on section goals, operational limitations, and tailor quarterly and personal goals. This added insight provides teams with the ability to more systematically approach KPI benchmarking and goal setting, ultimately driving continuing, uh, continuous improvement. Now, all these gains in operational efficiencies don't matter if there is a loss of well control. So the future of offshore optimization revolves around listening to what the well is telling you and acting preemptively. Automated flowback fingerprinting and tripping displacements give drillers a double check on these industry best practices. So whether you're drilling or accruing flat time, the integrated offshore platform of the future gives operators the right tools to optimize every operation safely 24 hours a day. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's possible. With that, I'll pass the presentation back to Ryan to introduce our last topic. In the rapidly expanding digital oil field, the team is bombarded with increasing data volumes. It's really hard to manage. Where can you go to get a bird's eye view when the data is scattered everywhere? I want to show you a new way to view and manage well information. The asset map is one way we are reimagining well data all in one place. We are literally bringing together every data set we have on a single map. This is actually a tough problem. It's really hard to get all this data into one place and make it lightning fast like Google Maps. We show MPT, alerts, directional, tons of operational parameters, and live comments by other users. I think this is really cool in just scratching the surface. These detailed summaries provide a complete snapshot of a well, enabling you to monitor everything in one view. The other way we're reimagining data is called Well Hub. In the digital oil field, big data is a complex mixture of structured rig data sources, documents, and unstructured well files. The persistent problem for drilling teams is that data is connect disconnected, forcing your team to jump in and out of multiple systems. Well Hub is your complete well data management solution. The new data dashboard represents a step change in how drilling teams interact with, discover, search, and manage well information. At a glance, Well Hub concisely shows all data sources. With the click of a button, you can download all of your real-time files, no more searching for this data in 10 different places, WITSML, surveys, BHL, logs, all here. Plus, 
A snapshot of current activity, app comments, alerts, and MPT events impacting operations. Truly a hub for your well data, built for the scale and complexity of today's real world digital oil field. Before we go, I wanted to introduce one more thing. When we set out to design the new well hub, we really wanted to revamp the experience you have while staying connected with your data. Introducing the iPhone and Android widget for well hub. Now you can carry around a snapshot of your operations right in your pocket. View your rig or frack fleet right from your home screen. That's it for today's main presentation. Just a quick glimpse into the future. Later today, we have a breakout sessions every 30 minutes from industry leaders on drilling, completions, and dev center app building. And be sure to make the party at 5 p.m. with a live band at the powder keg across the street. Now, we have a special panel on one of the biggest topics of discussion in the energy transition on ESG, moderated by Alisher. Working. Hi. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank test, you, Ryan. Test. ESG. Yep. Testing. All good. It's good. All right. ESG gained a lot of popularity in recent years. What appeared to be a vague discomfort about environmental and social issues has morphed into a genuine alarm among investors and consumers alike. More and more people in both camps view existential global challenges such as climate change, plastics pollution loss of biodiversity, deforestation, social inequality, and water shortages as tangible threats. Conventional wisdom has it that these are millennial issues. However, the evidence suggests that the concern is much broader. I'm excited this morning to introduce our panel of experts, Caitlin Allen and Sean McCoy. Caitlin Allen is a sustainability-focused entrepreneur, business owner, and CEO. Caitlin founded Global Affairs Associates, a boutique corporate sustainability consultancy in 2013. She and her team believe that business-centered approaches are crucial for creating long-lasting value. As CEO, Caitlin has grown Global Affairs Associates from an individual consulting practice to a well-respected boutique firm in Houston, serving clients across the United States. As principal consultant, Caitlin has consulted on sustainability and ESG issues, including strategy, risk, communications, and transparency for a variety of industries, including oil and gas upstream, drilling construction, midstream, and manufacturing. Caitlin speaks frequently on the drivers behind the ESG investing trend, the differences in approaches to responsible investment, and how companies can improve and articulate their ESG sustainability value propositions. Sean is the co-host of the Oil and Gas Global Network's ESG and Energy Evolution focused podcast. The network has 15 shows across a variety of topics with a combined listenership represented by over 1.3 million downloads across almost 200 countries. Sean has over 18 years of experience in the oil and gas industry across all three segments with a majority of the time on the upstream side with nine of those years being at Schlumberger. His roles have been in manufacturing, sales, BD, and marketing. He gave entrepreneurship a shot in the form of social enterprise that impacted the nonprofit and for-profit industries in 2017 and spent three years succeeding in every way except financially, bringing him back to the oil and gas industry at the end of 2019. He was asked uh, about a year ago to host the Oil & Gas Elevate podcast, which launched its first show in January of 2021. Sean is a veteran of the US Navy, native Texan, and father of three awesome kids that keep him humbled and busy, and husband to his best friend, Lisa. Please, a round of applause for our amazing panel. <laughs> All right, Kaylin, Sean, so to frame our today's... Us. Thank you. To frame our today's discussion, the first question is, could you please describe what is ESG and why has it risen in importance? Yeah, sure, of course. So I always like to start with the basics because uh, this is a concept that, you know, like many broad concepts, gets used in a thousand different ways. 
And uh, you know, if we're not all talking about the same thing, it can easily uh, become a very confusing conversation. <laughs> um, so I like to start with just what does ESG stand for? Where did it come from? What's the concept and what is it not? Okay, so ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance. And if you were to step back and think about, you know, put a list of things together that could affect a company's performance, any company in any sector, and you were to categorize them into four high-level categories, they would be financial issues, environmental, social, or governance issues. So we know financial is a given. ESG is anything that's not on your balance sheet that could affect your business uh, from a risk perspective, but also could represent our opportunities, right? So that's what ESG is. It's just a way of categorizing and thinking about the things that are not on your balance sheet. Unfortunately, um, particularly around here, I hear a lot of people mixing together the concepts of ESG and energy transition, climate risk, and even exclusionary screening and funds. So let me just give you a real brief um, overview of the responsible investing continuum. Um, you've probably heard of funds uh, that exclude anything. It could be alcohol or weapons, fossil fuels, et cetera. Those are exclusionary funds. Those are not ESG funds and shouldn't be considered ESG funds, although there's you know, some confusion about that in the capital markets as well. ESG uh, funds, from an investment perspective, are funds that proactively uh, vet for or examine E, S, and G factors for their investments alongside the financial factors. So it sounds a lot like safety, you know, things that this has been going on for a long time. But as you pointed out, I think a confluence of a lot of different factors has uh, led a lot of the issues that were con tr traditionally considered non-financial to, to seep into the, into the space of the, say, the broader capital markets. Um, so just starting with that, Energy transition, climate risk, those are specific E issues that are likely to be material to a company in the oil and gas sector. Um, but they may not be material to a company in a different sector. So just making that initial distinction between what is ESG, what is it not. Do you have anything to add to that? Yes, yeah, so I think the important thing to do is, is to add on to what you're saying a little bit. And that would be, you know, why is this, to your point of you know, where did all this come from, all this new kind of attention? So I think I try to think of a metaphor, at least an example. If we were to turn out all the lights in here right now, it goes totally dark. And you imagine all of this makes up all the different aspects of business, all the things that we do, and all of a sudden a spotlight turned on and focused on one chair, and just on that one chair right there. So imagine that one chair is ESG. That light that's focusing is what she's talking about. That's the money coming in from places like BlackRock and all this, ENG, all this investing capital is focusing attention on ESG, and that's what's giving it this kind of this new feeling of like this has to be important. Oh my gosh, I gotta I gotta pivot. What are we doing? How are we how are we adhering to these things? But understand that that light doesn't define what ESG is and why it's bubbling to the surface, because those three those three letters, environmental, social, what they stand for, those have really 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 uh, emotional issues tied to them. It's the one thing about our business, I've been in this for a while, and I love business, I love all these things, I love data, but one of the things we do a really, really poor job of is we go down this mantra of, we've all heard this saying, I heard it said many, many times, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, right? It's at the essence of what we're doing with data. I don't, I don't miss the irony of being part of this conference, heavy on data. You ask geologists what they wanna know before they say a well is ready to go. Give me as much data as you can. Data is extremely important. But how we administer that data, and what we do with it and how we decipher what it is and what it means to us is emotional. We're emotional people. And a big part of this is there's a stirring coming from those three areas and what they represent that are requiring us to do more than just look at something from an analytical place. And money is a big part of that. But take away nothing else and understand that money is not gonna solve those issues. Money is not gonna take away the history and the legacy we have as an industry and as a, as a civilization, as culture, going forward that we have, to, we have to lament. We talk about this all the time on the podcast, but we have to lament and understand how we got here and where are those issues and why they're so crucial. 
why they cause such a stirring in us. We just have gone through, as we alluded to earlier, this, the pandemic. And we talk about all the emotion and what it feels like to be back with somebody. Well, I don't know how to measure that, right? And as a professional in my career, I've been asked over and over again every day of my professional career to manage my emotions. We're asked to manage our emotions on a daily basis. If I have somebody come up and tell me that the oil and gas industry is filled with a bunch of crooks who don't care about anything except extracting resources from the world and you just want to, you just want to uh, take advantage and pillage and leave this place worse than it was before, I'm going to have an emotional reaction to that. If a customer calls you on the phone, I had a customer one time call me for about seven straight minutes. They let me have it in every way possible. They chewed me up and down, told me how important they were, how important I wasn't, how I was causing their problem. And I had nothing to do with that project. I had nothing to do with that situation. And I had an emotional reaction to that. And I had a choice on how I manage that. And we're asked to do that on a daily basis. Because what I shouldn't do is jump up and tell that customer to get stuffed, right? Or that, hey, this isn't my problem. I, hey, I agree with you. I don't know why it's so messed up either. You don't do that. So you have to manage your emotions. And a big, big part of ESG that gets lost and all the metrics and all the CO2 emissions and all the, the numbers and the data is this is about humanity and this is about people. And that we are more than just data, that we have to do something with that data. We have to do something with these situations. We have to recognize when somebody comes up and says, hey, I'm struggling in, in this situation from a mental health standpoint, from a diversity and inclusion standpoint. I, I, I th there's all these struggles that go on. You're gonna have to be able to manage that. And so with all those things that are important, and all these things that are super, super crucial, and again, I'm a data nerd guy at the end of the day, give it to me, give me all that you have, but the emotional side and the human side, I don't want that to get lost, that is a huge part of ESG, and that's why, regardless of that spotlight, being on it now versus not being on it earlier, doesn't change what it is and why it's gonna be there and why it's not gonna go away. It's not 3D printing, it's not an ISO standard, it's not something cool or the latest buzz. This is about people and humanity, and that has to be understood, I believe, going forward to truly understand why it's got such resilience and why it's been brought to the surface so far. And then the last part about this is, I believe with leadership, real leadership to step into these tough issues. Don't step away from them. Walk into them and understand why somebody on the other side is so angry about something why somebody is so pertinent about this one issue. Why is this so crucial to somebody? Make sure to take time to find out why that is that. Don't dismiss it because of your experience or because of what certain data points tell you. And I, I'm a little bit of a soapbox here and you may not remember much else from the entire day, but I want everybody to take away when it comes to this question because it is so fundamental to this topic. Everywhere you look, if you're in the, if you're in the professional space, the ESG is everywhere, every webinar, everywhere you go, every conference. Last conference I was at, a water conference up in Frisco last week. First question, what is ESG? I don't understand what it is. What's going on? What do I do about it? And understand that, yes, the metrics are important. Yes, the money is driving the attention. But at its core, are all those three pillars and everything that comes with it and all the history and all the legacy. But I do believe that with leadership and embracing these issues, we can address these issues and move forward and be progressive with them. So that's what I would say ESG is. All right, thank you for that. So last week I was having a, a nice conversation with a private equity firm here in Houston, and it is my understanding that uh, one of the challenges for major investors is actually a lack of strong metrics for ESG. Could you please um, hit on what is your experience of how ESG is measured and what do you see as challenges? Sure. Well, I always like to say a lot of people say there's, oh, there's not clear metrics, there's, you know, there's not comparable things. But actually, um, the problem, from my experience, is that there's too many metrics and there's too many different voluntary frameworks out there for how to measure or report ESG-related information. But let me back up to something. Again, it shouldn't be and isn't about you know, being all things to all people, reporting every single data point about your business. Um, it's about deciding which E issues, S issues, and or G issues are the most pertinent to your business and which are actually financially material, which could have an impact on your business's performance. So sometimes that list is very short for some of our clients. Sometimes the list is very long for other clients. But the first step is determining which 
issues are potentially going to have an impact on your business's uh, value and your, your shareholders, right? And your stakeholders, right? Depending on you know, your analysis of that situation, whatever business and industry you're in. Um, but then once you determine those issues, there are a plethora of voluntary frameworks to use that have different KPIs set out. So part of that process is determining which ones are appropriate, which ones do we want to use? And we've always come at it from the perspective is what is business appropriate? What works for your business? What is going to help achieve business objectives? And uh, make sure that the value of the business continues to grow. So um, a number of those frameworks are out there. We don't have to get into the alphabet soup right now. But yeah, it's not that there aren't metrics. It's just there's too many. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I always say to every, you know, every time I speak about this is standardization of metrics is a good thing. So it kind of levels the playing field. Um, and I also like to point out that the oil and gas industry is much more mature when it comes to ESG reporting than many other industries because this industry, at least on the EMP side, has been doing this for almost 20 years. It's just been an evolution of which frameworks, which metrics, where's the emphasis, those things have evolved. But this industry is much more advanced than many other industries when it comes to ESG reporting. Um, so this isn't necessarily something new. I think what's new is where the spotlight is. All right. I think to build on that, instead of, instead of just saying you know, ditto, which is what I would say, but I think to add a little bit of value, one of the things that uh, we've heard recently from companies that struggle with that situation is if you're in that point where you're not sure what those metrics are, it can feel overwhelming. A bit of advice from a context standpoint, wherever the company is at this moment, is don't panic. Is it don't, don't lose your shirt or feel like you're out of your league or that something's wrong because right now it's not perfect because there is so much confusion. It's a little bit like the wild, wild west is what we call it a lot of times because there's either too many metrics or not enough. You're not sure what the metrics are. Or these, these are valid metrics or these aren't. And we hear that when we talk to companies all the time about their ESG story and the rest of that. They have a story, but then how you qualify it and how the metrics work, it gets real, real convoluted. But don't panic if you don't have a clear set of what that means yet and give yourself some time to figure it out. That's what I would say to that. All right, thank you. So then with that in mind, what specifically, what kinds of things investors and shareholders are request, requesting from ENPs that are in the immediate line of sites that are mandatory? Sure. Well, um, you know, most of the, everyone talks about BlackRock, but it's not only BlackRock, right? BlackRock's a thought leader on this, but um, State Street Capital, Vanguard, all of these major firms that if you're publicly traded, you're probably, like, they own enough to be disclosed on your 10K. So that whole, uh, um, these massive asset owners, um, for the most part, are using two frameworks to evaluate, or they're asking for data according to two frameworks. One is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, or SASB, modeled on FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board, um, which is a US-based framework. And then, um, and it's also industry-specific. So those, each industry um, standards were developed with investors, so it's meant to be um, very, investor specific. Um, and then the other one is called TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which are the recommendations from the G20's Financial Stability Board. So I always like to say, these are the people that want us to all make money. <laughs> They're in charge of making sure our 401ks are worth something when we retire. The Financial Stability Board was so worried about uh, these global risks that are not priced into the market, so the risk of climate change, carbon, et cetera, are not priced into the market. So they're worried about the financial stability issues that could result if some of the worst impacts come to pass. Um, and they want companies to know and evaluate their business models against them. So that's what TCFD does, is these recommendations from this task force of the Financial Stability Board um, for how a company or a financial institution can take a look at the climate-related financial risks that might impact their business. So that combination of SASB, SASB, and TCFD, sorry for the alphabet soup, it really is crazy, but that combination is what most of the major investors are using 
as sort of a standard, um, or at least asking their portfolio companies to disclose to. We're seeing the same thing in private markets. So if you look at, um, you know, Prequin is, is one of the big private equity sort of data of survey uh, groups, and they have a new module um, on ESG, and they have also based their module on SASB and TCFD, same combination. Um, so that's like a, a very concrete, I can give you a concrete answer for that, but I also have a caveat, which is the big four accounting firms got together with the World Economic Forum and came up with their own <laughs> framework. So there's some interesting uh, competition in the voluntary reporting space. Um, but as of now, I can tell you that what most of them are being asked for is the SASB TCFD combination. I will add one more thing to that. We are hearing too, a lot of our clients are getting asked by their investors about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So how does your business help contribute to the sustainable development of the world? So everything from affordable clean energy to reducing poverty and hunger, et cetera, whichever of those that your company might have a purpose with, aligned with, they're asking about that as well, which is interesting. And I think to add to that, so example, at the beginning of the month, uh, Berkshire Hathaway had their annual shareholder meeting and they had two propositions that were put forth by shareholders to them. And they were asking them to specifically respond to climate change, how they were, how that affected their business portfolios, and also diversity and inclusion. So not only is it a standard that they're asking them to measure by, but there are specific things that they're asking them to look at and say, what are you doing about this? Citigroup had the same thing, Amazon had the same thing, and then coincidentally, Berkshire Hathaway, if you read the article about it, basically the board and the, and the uh, majority members, the voting members re rejected the desire to create that report and basically Warren Buffett and his crew said, thanks but no thanks. And part of that shareholder group was BlackRock. So this also tells you that as these lines become more defined, and these are heavyweight individuals in terms of market cap and financials and stuff like that. There's not really a consensus and they're asking for specific information. So when you have that accounting standard and it says, hey, what are you doing about diversity and inclusion? They're saying they want to know exactly how your, how your companies are made up. And when they reject that and say no thanks, that's also a message as well. All right, thank you. So then with that in mind, um, what kind of opportunities and challenges independent producers might face that may be different from their larger peers? Or are we all in the same boat when it comes to ESG? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, how many of you are familiar with the concept of scope one, two, and three emissions? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, just a few. All right, let me start with that because that really, if you understand this distinction, it, everything starts making sense in terms of what you see out there. So the, the global standard of how to delineate boundaries um, between a company's, any company in any sector. Um, so this is global standard. Um, their emissions is scope one, two, and three. Scope one is considered direct emissions from fuels that you burn. So um, <clears throat> diesel generators, whatever it is, that car in your fleet, you know, fuel in your fleet, um, filling up your cars with gas, any fuel that you as an entity burn is scope one. So any entity, or sorry, and then scope two is emissions from purchased electricity. So your buildings, you know, looking at all of those, um, <clears throat> those electric bills and seeing what the energy mix is locally, et cetera, making some calculations there. That's scope two. Um, <clears throat> scope three is where it gets really complicated. So scope three is considered Anything and everything besides scope two throughout your value chain, obviously with having to put standards of boundaries in place first, or the emissions embedded in your product. Okay, so this is what happens, right? So if, if I'm an EMP company, I have my scope one emissions, so everything from the drilling process, et cetera. I've got my scope two, my purchase electricity, and scope three, for oil and gas, the biggest attention, the spotlight is on the emissions embedded in the product because your scope three emissions, if you're an oil and gas company, becomes somebody else's scope one. See where I'm going? So somebody else is gonna burn the product and count those as their scope one, 
but you know, globally as a world, we all have to reduce scope one. That's where it gets really complicated because yes, EMPs produce a product that somebody else, is, else uses and so we, you can't, I think we shouldn't punish an EMP company for producing a product that people love and use, but the global problem where it's unpriced is that that's someone else's scope one. And actually there's been a study, I think it's IHS market, that almost 80% within a range you know, of, of, un, of uncertainty, around 80% of uh, oil and gas producers emissions are actually scope three. It's what's embedded in the product that makes up the majority of the emissions. And that's why you see such a focus on oil and gas in general because it's a global problem that's not priced into the market. And so then you have on the other, on the other side, um, you know, if you're, if you're a integrated major piece of the world, they already have you know, huge product mixes. It's not, it's hard, but it's not out of the question to say, okay, you know what, if you're talking about product emissions embedded in scope, scope three, whatever, we'll change our product mix. And that's what you're seeing BP do, Shell do, right? They're changing their product mix to address that big scope three question. But independent EMPs don't have that luxury, at least how their businesses look now, right? Because what are the maybe three products? NGLs, oil and gas. So that's, if we all understand that nuance in the conversation, then it, it becomes much uh, clearer why there's such a focus on reducing the burning of fossil fuels Generally speaking, it's because even though someone else burns it, it's getting burned in its an externality. Now, on the other side of that, if everyone knew and reported their scope one emissions the way they should, then it would become much more clear where the responsibility lies for the scope one. But that's why you have big companies like ConocoPhillips taking the position um, they have a net zero target for their operational emissions, scopes one and two, but they said for scope three, we're not gonna change our product mix. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go advocate for a carbon tax. So they joined the Climate Leadership Council, which is the bipartisan group um, <clears throat> uh, pushing for the carbon dividends plan, if you're familiar with that. They said, we think the market should solve that problem and the people that are burning our products should pay for that. So it's very interesting um, how different companies are taking different positions. Um, but th that concept, I think, helps understand why there's a little bit of a pressure. Yeah, so a little bit, a lot. Yes, yeah, so I think to add to that, where to look for, I think what to look for in regards to what she's saying, because that's all exactly true, carbon markets, carbon tax, carbon mitigation, and how that's measured is going to be a strong, strong indicator as to what's happening in that world and how that's going to be managed. Because right now, like she said, it's this open door and as you go down that and define that, if you, make, if you give carbon a value, as soon as that happens, it's going to open the floodgates in terms of this becoming almost, it's a commodity at that point, which is going to allow us to, to, to measure it, allow us to, to manage it, and allow us to do things with it. But until that time, it is this open door that, is that we, as these things come through, and if they're not mitigated properly, can become a huge issue. Like you said, when that scope three rolls over into scope one and your response, I mean, just do the math. Like she, like she was saying, it can put those independents out of, out of work. So it's, it's, or not out of work, but it can make it extremely expensive to operate, right? And start to almost force, and then it starts to feel like it's being forced. Almost feel like that's an agenda. It can make things really, really complicated. But the, the, the relief valve is gonna be the carbon markets, which all indications are there's something coming. Again, this is gonna be really difficult. How do you establish uh, a carbon value across the world? We can't do it with oil. We have different markets and stuff like that. So. It's not impossible, but that's, I would look in terms of answering that question in lieu of what she said, watch the carbon markets, watch carbon tax and see how that develops and how that's managed. And that's why you see API, you know, American Petroleum Institute um, advocating for a carbon price. They didn't advocate for the specific CLC plan, the carbon dividends, plan, but they said we're on board with the carbon price because it's all, it's all of this is about pricing externalities into the market, right? All right, thank you. Um, well, Sean, Caitlin, you mentioned in the beginning that there is room to many voices when it comes to ESG. So with that comes a lot of subjectivity. How do we know what is a good ESG rating? Oh, yeah, great question. The ESG ratings drive me nuts. <laughs> um, a lot of our clients that are publicly traded, if they're privately held, there's 
less of this going on, although like I said, Prequin is starting to do this score for private equity firms based on SASB and TCFD. But in, if you're a publicly traded company, <clears throat> you're always getting surveys. So MSCI will send you a survey, Dow Jones Sustainability Index, you know, you name it. Um, and there's many of them that are just, you know, the bot does a scan, you know, maybe a junior analyst takes a look, and then it comes to the company, and the company has to spend time and resources to respond to that. So I, I think, um, and just in my conversations with investors as well, there's not a single, you know, one rating or one score that any reasonable investor is looking at as the only data point. You know, and, and there's a pod, we have an, a podcast called ESG Decoded. There's an episode I did with um, Pavel Molchanov of Raymond James, and he says, it's kind of like credit scores, you know, in that if they're all generally in the same range of pointing toward great, pointing toward bad, pointing toward mediocre, that's probably where they are, but it's not that they're going to go make a decision based on those um, or any particular one specifically. So. You know, a lot of our clients, they are important to some more than others. Um, so we do help with, yeah, if you, okay, if you want to improve your score, here are some things you can do. But we try not to make that a focus because we know from the investor side that none of the investors are looking at a single rating as, a, as their only data point for this. So. All right. Yeah, I think in the spirit of that, think about it. I mean, not to trivialize it, but like Yelp and Google reviews and stuff that we see, there's an indication there. Right? In terms of what it is, you have variations, you have wild cards. How they measure certain things can change you know, metric to metric in terms of that rating. And because it is still so new, and then really what I think it comes down to, what we've seen most companies talk about, is it really goes internal. It really comes back to what you said in the very beginning, finding your baseline and going with what you know as a company and finding the points that matter the most to you in the short term. In terms of like, I need this to make sense to this person, whether it's a customer, an investor, or something else that's just an initiative internally. So I would, I would start in that area, understand that again, back to the shock factor, this group over here, MSC, I may send this to you and tell you how terrible you are. And that's true, I heard that there was a, we were talking the other day, there was a, uh, a hard energy at a conference and a guy got up there and basically said, that there's not even a single oil and gas company that has a good ESG rating. It's not even possible. That's not true though. I know it's not true. Lots of, he, lots of things that do. They do, yeah. his, 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 he was implying that it's not even part of the equation. Don't, don't worry about, don't, don't worry about it, it's gonna be terrible. And even if it is, just let it sit there. But do, do what you can to modify it and try to improve it in those areas that you feel like you can actually have an impact to change that score. But also to her point, it's not all bad. As well. I mean, our, one of our clients, Devon Energy, has really great ESG scores from different ratings and rankers because they, they do really well and they report on things that are important to them and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think there's just a lot of people care about the scores and ratings and rankers, but that's not really what a BlackRock didn't ask for everyone to fill out their MSCI survey. <laughs> they asked for them to do their own materiality assessment and determine what's important um, and report to SASB and TCFD. All right, thank you. So with that, how can technology, digital technology, can positively, or can it, uh, or and, and if yes, how can it positively impact your ESG rating? Yeah, well, we, so we think that all of the, the cumbersome old processes, data collection and whatnot for this um, should be digitized, we work with a digital partner um, that does, uh, they're called FigBytes, and they have a software that does, you know, basically makes it easy, because the team that's tasked with this, you know, it's a huge, huge job um, to do this. And so, you know, to save their time and resources, we always recommend our clients get on a software. If, and maybe they have an, in, you know, maybe they have Navex, Navex bought CSRware, so they can use that module now. You know, but digitize as much as you can of the data collection reporting. No one needs to be doing hand, you know, GHG calculations <laughs> anymore. But I, a lot of people still do that. Um, that piece, and then on the actual, just from a reporting, you know, reducing your survey burden, et cetera, web-based reports are really great. And we work with Brand Extract, um, who you know, uh, in, in town that does uh, web-based reports. In, and the nice thing about that is that it's just better for SEO, like for search engine optimization. I'm talking to a technical crowd here. I probably don't have to spell that out. But um, yeah, so, so 
web-based reports and then digitizing the data collection reporting process. Highly recommend all of that. But then on the measurement side, right, the bigger picture here is how are we going to have a sophisticated, transparent carbon market, right? We need good, reliable data. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. I've talked to many companies that are working on some piece of this or that. Um, but to have that market functioning, we're going to need a lot of very fair, probably blockchain-based data. So what I would jump on that is um, technology in terms of ESG, what she's saying, that's all true. The technology in terms of the industry is where, so one of the things we do for a podcast, not to promote it too, uh, too much, but if you allow me just a second, a little bit about the Devon story. R regardless of ratings, the, the one thing we hear more than anything, and what a lot of you probably would say, is nobody talks about the good things that the industry does, the, the advancements, not just, not just you know, something philanthropic or something like that, but I'm talking about massive technology advancements that allow us to do certain things more efficiently in all aspects, both from a cost standpoint, emissions, things of that nature. Uh, we're featuring Selfless Plug Corva on our podcast coming up about the software that was utilized to help do this ultra, ultra uh, the, the longest uh, lateral well, horizontal lateral well in North America. And we have, we have Jim who's in the back who's on there is it, from an insight standpoint talking about it and the impact that it had on that process. The technology that Corva was able to develop has an impact and maybe not something you can put in an, in an ESG rating per se, but it does have an impact on the environmental side in terms of the ability for that, that well to be done efficiently with less downtime, you don't have to trip out of the hole, things of that nature. That's technology having an actual, actual impact at the front, not just technology to help you measure all these things better, but what are we actually doing in those areas of ESG that utilize technology. Most of our episodes have been about that. Satellite imagery using artificial intelligence to do methane detection down to the wellhead in real time as literally as an operational standpoint. That's technology that's out there. There's so many things that are coming. And actually, the majority of the stuff that we've been hearing is all tech-based on that are real problems, business-oriented, profit-making solutions that both help the business and impact ESG. Back to what I was saying in the beginning, it's not about being data-centric or emotional. It's about bringing both of those worlds together. It's not about ignoring profit. It's not about ignoring the need for this. It's about bringing those things. How do I balance both and integrate both into what I'm doing? And technology will have a massive, if not one of the most centric roles to making that happen. And it continues to happen today. There are amazing stories out there the companies are doing that are a little bit, I mean, just something is in simple stuff. I mean, the more this, I shouldn't say simple, the data, the data, data, data collection is one of those pictures you see on LinkedIn. It's like, here's what data looks like, or here's what organization looks like, and here's what, you know, all these different steps in it. It's not just about having it, but what do you do with it, and how, what's the software behind that? How do we take all that and extrapolate it out to give me a different value point to not just have data, but a, an analysis of that data that helps me then do a better analysis, which is what we heard about this morning. That's all, that stuff all matters. That stuff has a real impact in all kinds of ways that do not just impact your bottom line, but can have an ES and a G impact as well, if it's within the frameworks and if you're looking at it from that standpoint as well. It is possible, and I do think technology will have an extremely important role in that area going forward for all those reasons. All right, thank you for that. So there's probably duality to the next question based on timeline and scope for ESG. But what is your opinion? Do ESG programs, A, create shareholder value, B, reduce shareholder value, and C, have no impact on shareholder value? Well, the answer to that is it depends on how they're structured and designed, right? And that's why we've always said it has to be a business-centric approach. That's what your investors want you to do. That's what even all of the voluntary reporting frameworks say at the very beginning in the instructions. <laughs> You do your own materiality assessment to determine what is potentially material to your company. If that process is done properly, then w absolutely, that's the whole point, is that it increases shareholder value. That's the whole point. Why would an ESG investor <laughs> you know, want anything except just better risk mitigation and companies to understand where the world is going and how they fit in? That's how it should be done. Unfortunately, um, I think they're absolutely been cases where a company didn't do a very good assessment at the front end or they were just you know responding to an external um, uh, say 
set of questions or external agenda and weren't really thinking about it from a strategic standpoint um, and how their business really could benefit. And when you do that, spend time and resources on something that isn't important to your company, well, we know that's going to decrease value probably. Um, but that's where I'm going back to it should increase value. That's the point, right? Right. No, I, I think to, to build upon that, it definitely because it depends. You don't want to spend all your time doing something that's not beneficial to your company. But in these areas, if you can focus on these areas, diversity and inclusion isn't just a nice rainbow thing to have at the end of the day. I remember uh, years ago a story uh, to brag a little bit about my, the old CEO at Schlumberger when I was there. Andrew Gould was in Saudi Arabia and was giving a presentation. And they were asking him what they needed to do to become more, you know, more proficient, to become better at what they were doing, all these kinds of things. And he made the statement to them, this is the story I've been told, so if it's wrong, forgive me, but I think the context will make sense. And part of the, part of the group that was there wasn't allowed to participate on an everyday function relative to the culture. And he pointed and said, half your workforce is not allowed to be part of all that you're doing. You're limiting that. And it wasn't, this isn't, it's not a, 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 a condemnation of that, of them for the sake of it. It's, it's about resource utilization. You're, you're not utilizing all the people that you could for this application. By something that's hard to, again, goes back to the hard emotional side. This is a hard topic, but what it ultimately does is it limits the resources that you have available for a company, for a business. And by doing so, back to shareholder value, my, uh, taking that, that scenario down, you are minimizing your, what you could have. You're minimizing the opportunities for these people, groups of people, in these different aspects to become part of this or even have the potential for it for, all, for, for, for different reasons. But by doing so, you have limited the, your, your growth pool. And by doing so, and as I would argue, you're limiting your ability to have shareholder value maximized. And so by bringing ESG into it, and, and look, sometimes we need a little help. Sometimes we need a Sherpa to bring us along the hike, right? Hey, help us along. By doing so and bringing this opportunity to the, to the, to the forefront, I believe it's going to create more shareholder value in those areas. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So lunch is coming soon. Our last question today is, what are the low-hanging fruit then for ESG opportunities of tomorrow? Um, okay. For, uh, <laughs> Going back to, we'd have to pick something specific, right? It's not, so is it E, um, energy transition, mm -hmm. climate, are we talking S? We're talking probably E, right? We're a tech group. Right, right. EMP. Let okay, let's focus on the E. Um, I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit um, with, this is just something I'm really interested in, is um, the application of uh, drilling technology for the new sort of geothermal anywhere. I don't know if you guys are up on this, but there's a lot of really interesting things happening in the geothermal space. Um, that is, um, you know, no longer restricted by having to be on a, you know, on a volcano in Iceland, right? There's a lot of really cool technologies being invested in by the oil and gas sector, by the way. Um, Ever Technologies is one of them, that are, that are basically making that possible anywhere. And we've had many discussions with different folks um, in the sector on, well, you know, can we repurpose some of these wells? Instead of plug-in abandonment, which we need to do anyways, why don't we see which of those will work for closed-loop geothermal? All you, all you need is high bottom hole temperatures and a, and a wide enough um, wide enough well bore. If that's sitting there, you know, let's let's get geothermal rocking in Texas. That's it's a almost a zero emissions, right? It's like next to nothing, and we've got the technology. The drilling contractors. So one of our clients, Precision Drilling, actually drilled the well, the test well, forever in Canada a couple years ago, because it's the same thing. You're drilling a well bore. So I think geothermal to me is very exciting, very interesting, and it's something where we have, I'm always about like, what is the existing technology, the existing infrastructure? How can we adapt that and do, think about it differently? Um, so I think geothermal is really interesting um, and there's some low hanging fruit there because the technology is, and the talent and everything is already here in this room. Um, what can we do to think outside the box about that in existing infrastructure? Um, 
I, I guess I could probably go on all day about that, but. No, and those conversations are really happening. There's people that I know. So if either one of those subjects are exciting to you in any way, yeah. we know actual people that are part of a plug-in abandonment uh, organizations. And I, I know people, just yesterday I was having a conversation at connecting people from the geothermal world to the plug-in abandoned world in Texas. So I'll, t I'll take the G column, if you will. I think a, a, a low-hanging fruit is to go internal to a company. And I would say in terms of culture, in terms of what you're doing and how, all these areas, are especially around diversity and inclusion and things of that area, it's real easy for me to look over and say, oh, here's this company over there and point fingers at this is what they should be doing and they should be doing this and this organization's not doing that. Let's spend a little less time crit criticizing other organizations and let's look at our own. Start at the top and work your way down. Have some basic questions. Have some conversations about these tough subjects that, we keep, that I keep bringing up that I know make us all feel kind of a little uncomfortable. Those are necessary conversations. I'll give you an example. Years ago, doing my own podcast around these areas, having these real tough conversations about race and politics, sexuality. I did a Me Too conversation and all the way home from talking to my friend about it, I realized that I had never had a conversation with my wife. We just celebrated 12 years. I'd never asked her about her experience as a person in the workforce, and she's been 30 years in development at Texas Children's. And I, I'd never asked her about her experience as a woman in the workplace. I'd never done that. And so instead of me criticizing all these other people for not having that conversation, I sat down and asked my wife about her experience. And there were things that I didn't know. So I would say, go internal to your company and ask these questions and have, and have an open dialogue. Because the, com the companies that we have talked to that have done this, rarely have I heard them say that they were worse on the other side. It may have been tough, it may have been difficult, but they have always, the, the evolution, if you will, back to the, we talk about energy evolution and transition in that same context. Part of this evolution are those things. It's not just, to, it's, it's, a, it's bringing those ideas and those elements into the fold and take what you learn internally. And it may not show up on a ESG rating or something like that, but I would guarantee you within the confines of your company, it's gonna make a huge difference if you do something like that. All right, thank you. Well, it certainly sounds like ESG is busy climbing the ranks. It seems like it's good for your business and for the environment, and soon it will become second language to every business owner, right? So thank you, Caitlin, Sean. So Caitlin and Sean will be staying through lunch in case the audience had questions. Thank you.